Welcome, everyone, to the Card Insiders Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Zakowitz, in season one of the Card Insiders Podcast. I'm speaking with CEOs, founders, and marketing executives about the challenges of growing a business, lessons learned, and how they adapt to the constantly changing retail and consumer landscape. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to kindly ask you to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five stars only. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or are interested in sharing your email marketing or e-commerce story, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at podcast at omnisend.com. Now, let's jump into today's episode. I'd like to welcome to the show the founder and CEO of Jiggy Puzzles, Kaylin Marcotte. Welcome to the show, Kaylin. Thanks for being here. Hi, Greg. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, we're glad to uh, have you join us. So, Kaylin, let's do a little bit of level setting here and uh, just briefly tell the audience a little bit about who Jiggy Puzzles is, types of products you guys sell, how long you guys have been around, and a little bit of the backstory, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So, we are a brand new company. We just launched in November of 2019. And my background is in media and marketing. I previously was the first employee at a media startup here in New York called The Skim. And the idea for Jiggy really came from those days uh, because, you know, it was early startup working around the clock and I started doing jigsaw puzzles as my form of meditation and stress relief and kind of nightly unwind. So I was doing them all the time, but all the ones out there that I could find were just really cheesy and outdated. And I wanted to reinvent the the classic puzzle for a modern audience and support up and coming creatives while we did it. So Jiggy Puzzles feature art by emerging female artists. We curate and license um, the works of art. The artist gets a percentage of every sale. We reinvented the packaging so the pieces come in a reusable glass jar. Um, And because the idea is that it's real art that you're putting together piece by piece, each jiggy comes with a tube of puzzle glue. So once you're done with the puzzle, you put it right on top. It dries clear and binds the pieces essentially as uh, one art print. So again, we launched in November. um, So first year in business and certainly a wild ride thus far. Absolutely. Appreciate the backstory. So you're working at a startup, you're doing something as a stress relief hobby. How did you know the time was right to say, okay, you know, let's, let's just go all in, let's quit the job, let's start a business and uh, just kind of go for it. Was there a tipping point or some pivotal moment that made you decide that, yep, now is the time to do it? Um, it was kind of a slower build than that. I had been doing them for a couple of years by the time I really decided to go all in on the business. So, you know, I first fell in love with puzzles as as my form of meditation. That was about 2015. And then I ended up staying at the skim through 2017. So for a couple of years, I was just kind of mulling it over, you know, thinking about what kind of product I would want as a consumer and and how I could improve on what was out there in the market. And then in that time, I also saw the rise of, you know, the adult coloring books and other kind of DIY movements that I thought might indicate that there actually was a market for this. So I think it was a combination of just this idea stuck and uh, I kept coming back to it and you know I couldn't get it out of my own head. And then also just seeing some trends and kind of the crafts and DIY that made me confident that there actually could be a business to be built too. Very nice. And you mentioned that you're more than just, you know, you're walking on the aisle of a Walmart or Target, you see a $15, you know, a thousand piece puzzle to the side. Mm-hmm. You have more involved than just, uh, like you said, old fashioned kind of uh, traditional jigsaw puzzle. Could you briefly describe who your typical customer is for us? Yeah, right now she is uh, a woman in her mid 20s to mid 40s, you know, living in a city and both looking for a the wellness aspect of it and also the the art and the decor. So, you know, as our tagline is puzzles worth framing and as I mentioned each one comes with the puzzle glue so we have seen really that behavior starting to to take hold of of keeping the puzzle framing it and using it as art. So, right now it's a millennial woman in a city looking to to unwind with the puzzle and then use it as art decor. And can you give us a little bit of a idea about a typical price point? I know you have different price points on the website, but what's a typical price point for one of your uh, puzzles? 
Yeah. So our retail is between 40 to $50. It's again, each puzzle, it's a puzzle itself. It comes with the reusable glass jar, the tube of puzzle glue, and then a percentage of each sale goes back to the artist directly. Um, so we have two sizes of puzzles and a bunch of designs in each size. And and yeah, they retail between 40 and 50. Very nice. And then there are other art puzzles in the market here. Um, certainly not a wide competition as you might get for a traditional jigsaw puzzle. But uh, what separates you from your competitors? Like why would a millennial woman choose to do business with you and not another puzzle company that is doing artwork? Yeah, I think a couple different angles. One is, you know, our direct relationship uh, with these artists. You know, a lot of kind of the bigger puzzle companies just, you know, have have these endless libraries, uh, not necessarily very curated or thoughtful um, and and not necessarily really empowering the artist or highlighting them. Um, so we, you know, story tell around who our artists are and their what inspired their work in our emails and social media. And then again, a, a percentage of every sale actually supports them. And then I think, you know, a, a customer who really cares about design and wants to appreciate that the products in their lives are thoughtfully crafted and really intentionally designed for them. So each component of our product and packaging is, you know, very thoughtful very presentable and giftable. We see a ton of gifting. So that's definitely a, a use case. I think we have that a lot of the, you know, other puzzle companies using that rectangular cardboard box and the plastic bag of pieces, you know, doesn't necessarily lend itself to, to a beautiful gifting experience. And yeah, you know, the presentation, we see people tagging us in their posts all the time and really a product that you you would want to display and are proud of it supporting female founder and female artists. Do you find that the, the you mentioned storytelling as both it, the background to the business and also in your previous answer that as being an important part of who Jiggy Puzzles is, do you find the storytelling to be more important for convincing or influencing consumers to make purchases or does the presentation aside that you just mentioned where you're getting tagged from on social media because of the presentation of it, or do you find that to be more influential or are they kind of synonymous with one another where you need one or the other? Tell us a little bit about the storytelling and the packaging side, if you could. Yeah, I think they definitely work together. And and what I've seen is a lot of people you know, land on the site or see a photo or, you know, read about it in a product roundup in a publication or press. And, you know, their first hook is that presentation and packaging and design and branding. And maybe they convert just on that. Or again, they think it, it would be a great gift. But then once they come to our site, you know, read our about page or sign up for our emails and start actually learning the founding story and my story, the artist's, then, you know, the more they either then convert or just, you know, glad they did and really start to become evangelists and, and brand loyalists. So we've kind of seen both tracks that potentially just the packaging alone and the designs on the puzzles, you know, the, it is very new. A lot of people, you know, the idea of a puzzle isn't, but them being refreshed and elevated you know, not your grandma's puzzles and, and really reinvented for them. That's certainly new. And, and we see a lot of people convert on that alone. And then once we actually get to tell a little more about why we're doing what we're doing and, and what's behind it, that's really where we see, you know, really strong repeat customer and, and wanting to tell friends and share on social and, and just become more evangelists. So you mentioned with the storytelling that obviously on the website, you kind of give it the background, you tell about, you know, the the female artists and all that. So you, you do that storytelling on the website. You mentioned email in there, and I'm not going to dig deep into your email strategy, but you're a relatively new business. As you mentioned, you, you opened up in November of last year, so less than a year in business. So are you telling, I'm assuming you said when they sign up for emails, I'm assuming your welcome series, assuming you have a welcome series, but is telling that brand storytelling mm -hmm. well, if 
my assumption is correct, and you are doing storytelling within the emails, is that something from the email standpoint you did from day one with communicating that story? Or is that something that you slowly, I say over time, it's been, you know, eight months or whatever, but is that something that from the email side, you started with one direction and then folded the storytelling into it as time went on? Can you walk us through kind of the genesis of storytelling from an email standpoint, either right out of the gate or an evolution over a short period of time? Yeah, we're we're definitely evolving it still and and certainly with individual campaigns that we're experimenting with, but you know, wanting to to tell at least the foundation of our story out of the gate has always been there. So, one of the first things I did was our welcome automation and it's a three email welcome flow and the first one is really product based, you know, we offer an incentive, a discount the second one is the brand story. So my founding story and what we stand for as a brand. And then the third is the artist stories. And we highlight from our debut collection, each of the artists link to their individual websites and pages. So so yeah, that was, was basically from the start, the automation that I had set up and the flow that I knew I wanted to walk customers through from, yes, certainly lead with the product, show our differentiators, but then really tell them our story and the artist's story um, immediately after. Very good. And you've mentioned email, website, you mentioned social. I'm assuming as a company, you're doing all the traditional paid search and uh, you know all the traditional digital marketing efforts. For the companies listening today, are there any digital marketing channels that you guys use that you ha- are having success with, or maybe you didn't have success with that you would have thought might've been the opposite. So, Hey, we didn't think email would be so good, or we really thought that paid social would be great and it's really not doing well. Any surprising insights one way or the other that you found with any sort of your digital channels? Um, certainly some of our individual campaigns for email have done much better than expected. You know, I, we have the automation set up and then for certain uh for certain you know timely or irrelevant things we send individual campaigns or launches i wasn't really sure how to benchmark what repeat rates would be or you know how often people would be completing puzzles i knew i was doing one every week but that probably <laughs> wasn't the norm um and and so some of these email campaigns have been hugely successful and really more so than expected. Instagram has been a big channel, I think, especially how visual our product is between the art itself and the packaging and some of that education we want to do around um, the different components, you know, the the glue. Some, you know, puzzle lovers out there have previously glued puzzles, but it's a fairly new kind of mass consumer behavior. So it's it's a very visual product. And so a channel like Instagram has not surprisingly, but but performed well given the the amount that we can showcase. And then yeah, paid search, you know, we try to compete a bit with the gift, you know, unique gifts, cool puzzles, puzzles for adults, things like that. It's it's a bit more saturated. So it takes a little more, you know, experimentation, um, but but trying to to hit that as well. So you can give away any metrics you want to. I'm not going to specifically ask you for metrics, but you said you you weren't sure how to benchmark repeat purchase rates, but you also have a high gifting threshold that you mentioned before. Mm-hmm. It, this could be an anecdotal answer, and I'm, I'm okay with that. Have you found that for first purchases, the majority of first purchases are for the individual or are gifts? And then on the flip side, the repeat, do you find that the repeat is for the same purpose or the repeat is the inverted purpose? So for instance, Mm -hmm. I buy a gift first time, but then I come back because I like it so much that I buy it for myself or vice versa. Do you have any sort of evidence one way or the other how uh, how those repeat purchases are swaying? Yeah, I think so far just with our, you know, limited history, eight months worth of data, it has been fairly seasonal, especially when we first launched and in December, you know, I think the first purchases were a lot of gifting and we saw a lot of multi-unit orders. So people, you know, buying four, five, six puzzles, kind of stocking up for gifts. And then, you know, once maybe it slowed down at the top of the year and they had more time for themselves, or certainly once, 
you know, stay at home and quarantine started happening and people were looking for activities for themselves to do at home. We saw a lot of those people who had previously gifted start to buy for themselves for an activity this spring. And then, you know, I think one component is also that we release in these collections and it's a fairly small size. You know, we, we launched with six SKUs. We just launched another six. So we've had essentially 12 SKUs, um, over the last eight months. And so I do see that people, you know, try one and then they pick whatever art that most resonates and then they finish that one and puzzles are addicting. You do one and you're ready for another. So we do see people, you know, coming back and picking another piece of art and I've heard, you know, some they intend to keep, some they don't. And the idea with the glass jar is that, you know, even if you do take it apart and put the pieces back in the jar, it's still very presentable, could sit on the bookshelf or coffee table. So we're definitely seeing seeing a mix. I think just seasonality by virtue of when we launched in November, December, a lot of those first orders were as gifts. And then we were able to stay kind of top of mind with our social and email. And so when the time came that people were looking for activities themselves, we were there. Does the fact that you guys launched in Q4, you know, a traditionally uh, big gift giving season, does that help? Does that make marketing for you guys harder or easier, do you think, throughout the course of a year? Because you are those so a lot of those initial purchases might have been for gifts, which may not be the the traditional course of action. Does that make it harder or easier for you guys to market, would you say? I think it made it easier in that it got the product in people's hands and a lot of the differentiators and marketing and, you know education around the product, the glue, the artists, we had such a surge in the first six weeks of, you know, kind of user generated testimonials, reviews, social media content. And so I think it helped really just kind of go to market quickly and get product in hands where then, you know, we could use some of that content and we turned on reviews on the site and testimonials. Um, we could use that for future marketing versus maybe a slower burn where um, it wasn't gifting, but we, you know, had had kind of slow and steady out of the gate. We kind of came out with a bang and the use case was gifting. But, you know, I also view gifting as, you know, kind of a two for one. You get the person who purchased it and you have their email and can retarget. You also then they introduce it to someone new and on our packaging, there's our website and social, you know, they open it, they want to post about it. So, you know, potentially you kind of get get two uh, customers in one with gifting. So I think it definitely kind of led to some of those ripple effects of just creating some buzz and, and word of mouth growth. And then certainly those first two months really set us up to have some, you know, assets to market with some reviews, content, user generated stuff to to then turn into campaigns going forward. I think the one great thing about gifting as well is that if you it doesn't matter what it is, but if you ever get a really nice gift that you immediately think of or store in the back of your mind for the next time you need to give someone yeah. gift something that you immediately go to it. And I could think, I mean a couple of years ago we got a gift, me and my wife, for something. And you know, it was a time where traditionally you get flowers or food or something like that. And we got this one gift that every time has come up since then we've gifted that because it was so it was just a little bit different exactly it was so good you know I, I was like that is a great gift and we've i mean we just gifted one about a week ago That's yeah the thing. exactly it's i think it's been two years running we've seen it definitely the puzzle it feels it feels more unique it feels more thoughtful a little more special more unique than yeah those same scenarios where you might give a bottle of wine or flowers you know housewarming, birthdays, things that, you know, could be just the standard gift, but it it certainly stands out a bit and feels a bit more thoughtful. Very nice. And I'm going to pivot a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I normally ask uh, the, the guests about their number one challenge they've had growing the business over the last couple of years. You guys have been in business for less than a year, but you also launched at a very peculiar time in, yeah. uh, in world history. So not even U.S. history, just world history, if you think about that. You know, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. You guys launched right 
as COVID was kind of creeping up, we really had no idea what the potential impact was quite yet. So when you began to see what was unfolding, what was going through your mind as a business owner, especially a new business owner? And are there any initial steps that you first took to help prepare yourself or protect yourself from, you know, the, the worst case scenario? Yeah. You know, we, we, uh, we'd been in business about four months and really just figuring it out for the first time, you know, they, all the kinks and logistics and fulfillment and customer experience. And I was a one woman show. I had no, I still have no full-time employees, but at that time had no contractors either just onboarded a 3PL, you know, I had previously been shipping out of my apartment. So there was a lot still very much in the works in just infrastructure and, and getting everything set up. So once, once this started happening and it became clear that, you know, this quarantine and puzzles actually go well together and we were hearing, you know, people looking for activities and the idea of spending all this time inside that puzzles actually could provide some entertainment and small moments of joy. And I was hearing from, you know, people talk about gifting. People were, you know, sending a puzzle to people that they obviously couldn't see in person and just a little gesture of outreach saying, I'm thinking about you. I miss you. Um, I heard from one woman who was quarantining alone. And so she did puzzles when, you know, she couldn't sleep at night or just was feeling lonely. And so it became clear that, you know, this, these are circumstances we never could have thought of. And with, with so much just hardship and pain and anxiety that we had a product that, you know, in the smallest ways could just help alleviate some of that. And that was a moment that we wanted to show up for what was, difficult is that we were not <laughs> ready in terms of inventory. Um, we quickly started selling out and and rushed back into production. But, you know, production takes a little while and, and we weren't able to expedite things with, with everything else. Logistically, freight, you know, all the, the supply chain challenges happening at the same time. So, we actually came up with this campaign that I was really proud of. It was called our originals. And, you know, when we were selling out of puzzles and it was clear that puzzles were kind of going to be a, a hot item of this time, we were also hearing from our community of artists that they were left in a really tough spot and, you know, galleries and, and exhibits were canceled and, you know, commissions were drying up and they didn't have a ton of ways to support themselves. So, what we did is we got blank white puzzles made, so a different supply chain, uh, and it was able to be done quickly. So we got blank puzzles. They're pre-cut, so the you know the pieces were cut, but they were still intact, flat, and there was no image printed on the top. And so we started distributing these blank white puzzles to our community of artists and just asked them to draw and paint directly onto them and essentially create a piece of art directly onto this puzzle. And so we started auctioning them. So we launched originals in May, early May, and auctioned these puzzles as original art. And the artists got the proceeds. And then from our portion of the proceeds, we donated to two COVID relief funds, one for artists and one for New York City, where we're based. So, you know, there there was really no predicting these circumstances. And once it started to happen, and we were actually, you know, growing from it, it became clear of, you know, how do we do this responsibly and how do we have an impact? And, you know, there was a bit of, I use the term survivor's guilt with a friend who also has a business who was doing well. And there is a bit of that and it's, it's complicated, but we really just approached it with how can we, how can we do this you know, impactfully and responsibly and bring some puzzle joy. So there were certainly a million logistical challenges through it, but that's kind of how we we rose to the moment. Very nice. And two follow-up questions here for you, one on logistics and the other one is when you were auctioning these off, uh, do you know offhand what the, the highest selling puzzle was from a dollar, from a dollar amount? Yes, we sold a puzzle for four thousand three hundred dollars. Get out! <laughs> yeah, that is unbelievable. Yeah. 
it was a, a, his name's Futura. He's kind of a legendary New York City graffiti artist. So while we normally only work with emerging female artists for this campaign and because it was all fundraising, uh, we included uh, some New York City artists and some were male. And he is, for in, you know, in the 80s, he did subway art and street art and exhibited, you know, galleries with Basquiat and um, Herring. And he's, he's just a legend and he spray painted a puzzle for us. And there's a collector in Australia who had never had a chance to own an original. And there were hundreds and hundreds of bids and he ended up winning it. Yeah. For over $4,000. Wow. That is awesome. So that was amazing. Most of them were kind of in the three to 500 range. Still a good number. Still yeah. a good number. Yeah, very cool. The other question I had for you was around more the logistics side. So we are, you know, halfway through the year, a little more than halfway through a year, but Q4 is rapidly approaching for us. Yeah. So has, in some fashion, has the struggles that you've had to go through with production and supply chain uh, interruptions and things like that, has that helped you at all in planning for one, a potential disruption moving forward, uh, but also for a, just a busier time of year? Uh, as Q4 ramps up, is has the challenges you've had before impacted or helped you at all? It's definitely just shifted kind of our our yeah preparation and and kind of planning. You know, not being as dependent on one supply chain and kind of setting up some some secondary ones and some backup plans and really using this time. We launched our summer collection. You know, it's it's actively selling now, but we are using this summer really to gear up. This is our first you know full year in business, so the first real time that we have to plan for the holidays last year. It was kind of a mad dash to launch for November. Um, but you know, a lot of the press and opportunities and partnerships happen, you know, now Christmas in July. So we're starting to, to really use this time to get ahead of it. Very nice. If you're looking back at the last, you know, eight, nine months, if there's something that you know, live and learn, right? Hindsight's always twenty twenty. If there's yeah. something you could look at from a business perspective and say, man, I wish I could really redo that. Is there anything you could point to? I mean, if I only knew if someone, you know, in February, <laughs> I was doing our first trade show and talking to some wholesale, exploring wholesale. And, you know, if someone had told me like, don't do any of this, you know, you're going to sell out, forget wholesale, you know, really double down on on your relationship directly to consumers, be ready with inventory and logistics. I I absolutely would have brought on help sooner. You know, I brought on my first contractor to help with some operations and and CX, but would have done that sooner and just kind of, you know, mentally emotionally braced for a, a crazy few months. But yeah, I probably would have, if I had known uh, Crystal Ball, would have deprioritized wholesale and really just prepared, you know, every aspect for for the spike that came from D to C. Do you have other business owners or executives in different areas that you rely on for either advice or help or anything like that? I do, especially you know, having I've been in New York for. 12 years now and, you know, four years at the skim. And so I had many opportunities to network with other founders and entrepreneurs. And through, through the skim, we took a uh, venture capital investment. So kind of the VC community. So yeah, I've, I, I don't have a formal kind of board or advisory board for Jiggy yet, but I have my go-tos that I certainly lean on, uh, and, you know, especially as a solo founder, I think a lot of the conversations I end up having with them, people might have with their co-founders if they have them. But even just those like, is this idea crazy? What do you think about this? Just like the gut checks are really nice to have a speed dial for. Do you generally find that I'm thinking more for other business owners or even executives who want to bounce ideas off of, do you generally find that just, I mean, you've had... A lot of people have similar situations, maybe not working at the skim, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, similar situations where they cross paths with different people all the time and they have, you know, direct communication where if they want to, they could always shoot an email or a message off to them and say, Hey, 
had this idea. Can we spend a few minutes talking through? Do you think it's, it's almost essential for business owners or executives to have that now to kind of shield themselves from any blinders they might have? Yeah, I think absolutely. And especially if, you know, no one founder, if you're putting together a team of co-founders, you know, I think of like Casper, which I think had five co-founders, then maybe you can get kind of a subject matter expert for everything. But I think especially if you're a small team and just trying to hack everything together, then having people who really know a different area of the business, you know, especially for me, it was manufacturing coming from media. This was my first physical product. So people who just had more of the language and kind of creative approaches and, you know, could say, well, have you, you know, offered that the factory, you know, maybe you pay this up front and then this, or could you do split air and ocean to get some in time? And, you know, just the creative problem solving that having some familiarity and expertise can allow for. I mean, that's been been hugely helpful. And I don't think you necessarily need to have all of those relationships solidified before taking the leap and starting a business. But certainly as you go, utilizing LinkedIn and any kind of networking affinity groups um, that you can join and and making sure that you can get to the right people when you need them. I think a, a lot of times people might not take the leap if they have an idea because there can always be one more thing, one more experience or resume builder or skill set you convince yourself you need before you start. And I would say, you know, you, you're you never going to be totally ready, but try to set yourself up um, to, to have that help when you do need it. Very nice. And the answer for, it's going to be a slightly different answer to this question, but you're talking about relying on other people for advice and guidance and little practical tips and tricks. Is There's another with actually getting stuff done, right? There's always mm-hmm. the, the to-do list. And you mentioned that, you know, when you started, it was pretty much you running everything. So you've talked about implementing marketing emails and automated emails, but you're also doing uh, social media and then paid search and paid social. So other, you know, and this is a pretty common thing, but other retailers out there have limited uh, team numbers or they're just kind of a one person show. What advice would you give to people? Like, how do you get stuff done? How did you get <laughs> emails automated and posting the social and responding to people and dealing with customer service stuff and managing production? Like, how are you doing those things? Is, is there, you making lists or do, or do you have a, a different skill set or tactics that you would recommend people investing into or looking into? Like, how, how'd you do that? Yeah, yeah, definitely live, live and die by my to-do lists. And um, I'm a hard, hard notebook writer, not, not any of these tools or, or digitally, I need it to write it down, cross it off. But also I think what I realized for myself, at least in the beginning, I was trying to do everything in a day and that context switching was actually really difficult to, you know, be deep, deep in the weeds of production and comparing, you know, quotes from freight forwarders and then, oop, okay, time to post on Instagram. Let's come up with a witty (laughs) caption. You know, it was just, too much context switching that was actually losing productivity. Um, so I've gotten much better now about really time blocking. And you know, there are full days of of going in the weeds on something. So if I know that it's not going to be the headspace I need to be in to, you know, do a post or write an email or do some of the more content stuff, then you know, planning planning the week's worth out so that you know it's not a daily thing, but getting ahead of that so that I can be more heads down. So I think just time blocking and and understanding that there is shifts in that context switching that, that can be tricky if you're trying to just bounce between tasks all day. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've always been really good with time management. I've got my own system that I use and I, I'm slowly getting into more and more time blocking. So I, I feel how that can be beneficial for you Mm because I'm getting into it myself right now. So very nice. I've got a couple kind of soft questions for you before we end, but just kind of if we want to kind of encapsulate everything today, one parting piece of advice you'd you'd leave the audience today, either looking to uh, grow their business or find better ways to do things or improve their management experience, whatever it might be. Uh, What's that one thing, one piece of advice you would leave to the audience? Oh, the the piece of advice I'm trying to to take myself is, you know, it's been said before, but just 
prioritization and focus. And the the co-founders at the skim got a piece of advice from one of their investors that they've actually passed along to me. And I think of it often. And uh, the line was, your job as CEO is to continually be firing yourself. And I think really what it gets at is, you know, of course, in the early days, you have to be doing everything. It just has to get done. But as you grow and as you start to build a team, really, your job is to, you know, identify the tasks, the areas that you should own and the ones that you shouldn't. And for the ones you shouldn't, find the best person, put them, you know, in in place and empower them to do so, get out of their way. And so your job, you know, as the executive of the business is really to be firing yourself. So I think about that and I'm as we're growing and as, you know, we are able to bring on some help, I'm I'm continually thinking of, you know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? How do I really get out of my own way and and Jiggy's way? And I think the worst, my worst fear would be that I would, you know, my limitations would stunt the growth of the business. So constantly thinking of how, you know, I can get the right people in place and then empower them to help Jiggy and and get out of their way. Very nice. And if my boss is listening, she said, fire yourself, not others. <laughs> out there. Okay, Caitlin, just real quick before I let you go here. Some people read a lot of books, some do puzzles, some listen to podcasts, uh, digest, you know, quicker news stories, whatever it might be. Uh, I don't I don't know which category you fall into, but what's your favorite or recently liked either business book, podcast, magazine, newsletter, website, whatever it might be? What would you say that would be? Yeah, I, I'm all about the newsletters. Ever since the skim days, I've been signed up for a bunch of them. So now being, you know, transitioning into this kind of D2C and retail world, I love like Lean Lux. Um, I read that one every day, 2 p.m. Um, this account thing testing that's just trying all these new brands. So that helps me kind of plug into to this world and stay stay atop that. And then and then I'm a big audiobooker. So that's actually how oftentimes if I really need to meditate, I'll just puzzle alone in silence. But often I put on an audiobook and make some tea and that's kind of my ritual. Um, so I listened, the last one I listened to was um, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Um, yep. so I puzzled and, and listened to the audiobook of Shoe Dog and uh, I loved his story. Awesome. Uh, Lean Lux, 2 p.m. or Retail Brew, which one are you choosing? Uh, which one am I choosing? I'll go with yep. Leanla. Okay, very good. This was on LinkedIn a couple of days ago and I was following the thread. And I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. So very good. And final question for you. Well, that's a lie, but pretty much to the end. One meal for the rest of your life. What meal are you choosing? Ooh, so I would probably go with <laughs> people. I have a very polarized order because my weakness is French fries. But then I also okay. try to be healthy. So my favorite healthy is like a good Greek salad with like cucumber, tomato, Kalamata olives, feta cheese, and then a side of like truffle Parmesan fries. <laughs> <laughs> very good. That works. You're, you're balancing <laughs> the world there. So very good. Uh, Caitlin, any questions for me today? No, thank you so much, Greg. All right. Well, we'll have info in the uh, show notes or episode description of how to contact you. If someone wants to reach out, how about uh, verbally uh, give the URL for the company, if best way to contact you if they want to, um, whatever contact info you want to give away, feel free to uh, do yeah, that. Yeah, we are um, Jiggy Puzzles across everything. So JiggyPuzzles.com, uh, social, all our handles are at Jiggy Puzzles. And then Hi, just hi at jiggypuzzles.com is our, our inbox. Excellent. Thank you so much. Kaylin Marcotte, everyone, founder and CEO of Jiggy Puzzles. Kaylin, thank you for your time. And to everyone listening, thank you for yours. Again, if you have any questions, comments, or are interested in sharing your e-commerce or email marketing story, please email us at podcast at omnisend.com. Don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And until next time, have a great day and be kind to one another. Bye.